You ready to do this, Matt? Yes, sir. Punch it, Chewy. Welcome, super friends, to the Fortress of Nerditude podcast, a safe place to talk about all things in nerd and pop culture. I'm Spencer Stapleton, and my co-pilot is Matt Shaw. We're two nerds that just refuse to grow up. Thank you for joining us. This is episode 143. We release every Thursday morning. You can find us on the website, fortofnerd.com. We have links to iTunes, Google Music, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, and everywhere podcasts are available. Stop by and relax a while. If you like what you're hearing, hit that subscribe button and get us automatically each and every week in your ear holes. Matt, it has been a week and a half, it feels like, since I talked to you last. How are you? I'm doing really well. The question is, how are you and are you surviving? You had a cold and a huge week ahead of you last we talked, so uh, I'm interested. Uh, I'm alive, okay. so... I talked about this a little bit last week. So on the cold front, the cold's pretty much completely gone. Just a slight bit of congestion, but that's kind of not neither here nor there. Not yeah. nothing really to speak of, which is good. Um, I did like stay on the whole Nyquil, Dayquil kind of train as long as I could until I realized I didn't need it anymore. Um, you know, just you know, doing the thing you got to do. But this week, uh, like I said, I'm in the kind of the stretch of like. 21 days straight without a day off and the reason for that is we're taking two of our offices and we're combining them into a new facility and this last week has been literally 16 to 18 hour days every freaking day we we did have one day where it was like 12 hours and we were like hoo, we get to get some (laughs) extra sleep um but today was move-in day so last night I think, ooh, I think I got home close to midnight. Um, got done everything we possibly could. We still had some more stuff we had to do today, um, but we were waiting on some parts. And today was move-in day, and everyone had to bring their stuff over. Everyone had to move in, and it went fairly smoothly. Um, not a lot of problems, but there was stuff that we had to kind of fix on the fly and still had to finish up two of these conference rooms kind of on the fly because, like I said, we were waiting on some parts. My boss came into town so he could spend a day or two with me, but also, like he said, so he could help. But by the time he showed up, it was like 3 in the afternoon. <laughs> and so uh, we were just kind of finishing up a little bit of small stuff. So, so yeah, it was kind of a, like this hectic week. Like we were – we were doing all sorts of things. So like, for instance, in our building, we have conference rooms and these conference rooms, even though like facilities, like make sure they've got a table and chairs, IT like cuts in table boxes and we put in, you know, HDMI and VGA and ethernet mm-hmm. connections and all these table boxes and power and USB. And we wire up the TV and we make sure like all the tech works. And so like really the conference rooms, with, you know, the phones and the TV and all this stuff, like, falls kind of under the tech department. And we had to install six conference rooms in this new uh, in this new office. And so we're also working with our contractors and the vendors that are running all of our cabling and trying to get all the termination stuff. And we have security doors that require door access, like badge. You have to, like, swipe your badge over right. a, a keypad. So they're badge access doors. And, like, trying to go through all of that and get it all tightened up. Like we were, we felt like we were like maybe 80% of the way there, like four days ago. And then these last like four days just seemed to drag on and everything took way too long. And we had an issue where the guy that does the security doors like went on vacation because he'd had a family vacation scheduled for months. And this project kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back so that the kid that was there did not know how to do the doors but in his defense like he spent something like 26 hours working on on this front door trying to get it right for us and he got it like 95 percent of the way there's still a couple things that just need to be like fine-tuned but like 
I was really impressed with him. His name is Austin. Uh, I know his father. And I was like, he's not giving up. He's working hard, even though he's never done this before. Like, he's trying to figure it out. Like, you know, I was I was really, uh, really impressed by him. But we got to go back. We got to figure some stuff out. I mean, there were some things that weren't done. And, you know, the boss of that company, you know, we got to make sure he lives up to the terms that he agreed to in the contract. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so there was some of that and just, I don't know, super, super crazy, super busy coming in at like two, three in the morning, going Golly. to sleep for like four hours and then getting up so I could go right back to work again. Um, now thankfully I don't have to do this all the time. So by the time this podcast releases on Thursday, I'm going to be back to my normal regular schedule, uh, type of situation. Um, but right now on Monday, like I still got like another long day ahead of me tomorrow. My boss is still in town. Uh, we went out tonight for dinner and went to this like very fine restaurant, had a uh, prime rib and hey. both my boss and the guy I'm working with, they both drink and I don't. Um, and so since they were going to be drinking and eating, we put all of the tab on my company credit card because my boss just approves my purchases. And so it's not a problem. But if he put it on his, then his boss would have ah, to approve it. And so he'd smart. probably get a little, little a little, uh, you know, he'd get questioned maybe a little bit. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll just put it on. I'm like, you're going to yeah. authorize it. So, you know, drink and eat whatever you want. And and since we were kind of celebrating the completion of this big project, we told the waitresses that it was our birthday. Because oh, yeah. in a way, it was the Go birthday big. of the building. So they brought us like this like mud pie, like dessert thing. And we all nice. had a couple bites of it. I uh, went for a drive up the Ogden Canyon and just kind of hung out and talked. It was good just kind of hanging out uh, with my boss in just kind of a, a casual way because mm-hmm. uh, I don't get a chance to do that. He's back in Michigan, so he's got to fly out here to see me. Mm-hmm. So I usually only see him in person maybe like twice a year. Right. But, uh, yeah, that was today. Tomorrow is – so, oh, oh man, how did I forget this? Today was the first day of new preschool for the boys. Yes. So they left Miss Brittany, the woman that like, I don't know, basically raised them for the last three or four years <laughs> um, because she, I mean, she does. She loved our kids and it, Brita said it was heartbreaking having to uh, to tell her that we, we had to move on, but it yeah. did work out better for us with, you know, the school schedule and the transport back and forth to school. But we loved Miss Brittany and we loved taking our kids to Brittany and... So they got to they got to go to the new daycare today, and it seemed like both boys said they had a real good time, that good. they really liked it, that they had fun. But tomorrow is the first day of school, and unfortunately, I can't be there because I've got to be into work early, and it's you know another long day. But first day of school, Jackson starts kindergarten, Charlie starting first grade. Uh, Jackson tonight, like I got home kind of late. But the boys were still kind of a little, Charlie was barely awake. He was talking, but you could tell like he was about, like if I would have stopped talking to him for like a minute, he would have been asleep. Right. But Jackson was kind of, he was kind of up and he was kind of a little worried and a little nervous. And Mm. he was asking mom about like a kindergarten and what are they going to do the first day? And she's like, you're basically going to watch like a little video and eat some snacks and kind of like see your classroom. And, you know, mommies and daddies have to do all the paperwork and whatnot. But he was kind of a little, you know, a little nervous. And I was telling him, I was like, man, it's going to be so much fun. You're going to get to go and see your new class and make some new friends. And you're going to get to start learning a bunch of stuff. And you're a smart kid. So you're going to learn fast. And he was kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to. So, uh, so I'm excited for him. It's a, it's a big step for him. You know, he's starting school and I wish I, I really, really, really wish I could be there. Unfortunately, it's just not going to work out that way. But but I did tell the boys that since I've been gone for so long and like literally like there's, I don't know, probably five, six days in a row now where I've been in bed hours after they went to sleep and I'm up and out the door before they even wake up um, that we're going to have to do something. So we may talk about, I don't know, maybe maybe doing something, maybe taking a couple of days off or something to make some sort of like little family yeah. trip or some sort of family activity, something so I can say like, Hey, I gave some more time to my boys to kind of help compensate for all the time that I was gone. Right. 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 Um, right. But since I've been so busy, Matt, can I just tell you that my yard looks like a freaking jungle? <laughs> oh man. Well, I, uh, grass is like two feet high back there. Yeah. It's nuts. Oh, yeah. So 
Uh, what are you gonna, hopefully what are you, you don't do? have an electric mower. Hopefully mm. you get a nice powerful gas mower. It is. It just, you know, I'm gonna have to either do it a couple times or just like bag it up and like empty yeah. the bag like eighteen times. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, at least you've got grass out here. It's uh it's stopped growing because it's all just dying. No matter how really? much I water it. It's been like a hundred degrees for two weeks straight. And so hmm. we've got no rain limited cloud cover it's uh i haven't mowed the lawn in like three weeks and it still so, doesn't really need to be mowed <laughs> let me let me let me ask you a question since you're a a, a newly first-time homeowner because i'm still a, technically a first-time yeah. homeowner even though i've been in like for five years right um did you do any like fertilizer this year at all uh when i first got in i did okay on so the grass i I did fertilizer at the beginning of the spring when we put down a whole bunch of grass seed and it was kind of coming up. And then we got to like the early middle of July and like that was starting to like brown and die. I was like, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. And then someone said like, there's a different fertilizer you put on in like the middle of the summer. That's like heavy with nitrates and you or something and like you put it down and then you make sure you water like really good for like a week maybe. Right. And those nitrates get in the soil and like help the roots go down really, really deep which then helps them become hmm. really strong so that they end up holding more water and more color. And now like my freaking backyard, like I'm also got like weeds and stuff growing that I have to go take care of. But the grass has like gotten stronger and greener in like the hottest part of the summer here. Nice. And I didn't, and I didn't know that like this is nice. for five years. I've been struggling. Like you mean to tell me someone could have told me, <laughs> but anyway, so maybe look into that. I don't I'll know. I'll have to check it out. I've given up this year. It's over. Yeah. Well, but you know what? Year. <laughs> maybe you go toss it down there and you water a bunch and maybe it'll, you know, green back up some and come back to life. Yeah. We've, yeah. We'll see. We've got some, we have a sprinkler system here and now I'm noticing that there are several broken sprinkler uh, heads and stuff. Yeah. So every that's, spring, that's not fun. Every spring, that's a project for me. It's like, okay, let's go see which sprinkler heads got buried again, which right. ones need to be pulled up, which ones are broken. Busted in some way. Yep. yep. I hear you. I hear you. How's Emmy? How is she doing? Oh, man, Emmy's great. Emmy's great. She, she's happy. She's crazy. She's almost – she's done really well with potty training. She's uh, She yeah. doesn't have too many accidents. She still has them every once in a while, but – what do you expect from a two yeah. and a half year old? You got to be yeah, patient yeah, yeah. and calm, but she's, she's doing great, man. She's, she's crazy and happy. And we put her in bed usually at like seven 30 and she doesn't go wow. to bed sometimes until like nine, but she just mm -hmm. sits in her bed, grabs some books, she like reads, hangs out hey. in her room. She, she can get in and out of her pack and play, which is what she sleeps in. But so we bought her that bed that I put together Yep. And just switches between the two. She doesn't come out. She usually doesn't freak out too much. Hmm. So we're, we're lucky in that way, but she's a handful during the days. How long till Lando's born? He is born sometime at the beginning of October. October 4th is Jesse's due date. Okay, so she's going to be like two and a half and potty train yep. for what? Like maybe like a month, two, 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 two and a half Something months? Something like that. We'll, we'll see if it sticks. What kind of life event is going to mess with her schedule? But so sh she'll regress some. De we definitely, expect it. we yeah. know it, and she's she she even now just has spurts in and out. So we we've come to expect that she's going to have a yeah. lot more daddy time when Lando comes, and we've tried to tell her you're going to be spending a lot more time with daddy and yep. hanging out with him, and so which she's fine with. Let's be honest. She loves me. <laughs> I hope so. Just party hard with her is all I do. But that's right. Um, you got yeah. you got to know how to play like that that fine line of like I'm still your dad and I'm responsible for stuff and all. Like you step on line, I'm taking care of you. Yeah, but I'm also gonna spoil you rotten. Right. So we've had we've had some fun. It's been actually a really fun week for us. We we did a lot of I don't know really cool fun stuff. Getting ready for Lando, so we bought 
all the things that we wished we would a have cape had for Emmy and the little fake mustache. Uh, mm-hmm. No, and they're still on me about that mustache. Who's on you about uh, this? My freaking mother and my wonderful wife. Okay, they're just they not li- sure about they, it. Do they listen to this podcast? I doubt it. I don't. Okay. Well, my mom, my mom started to. I think since since I started getting on it more regularly, but Jesse doesn't. All right, Mama Shaw, listen up <laughs> real close. I know you've raised kids, and I know you're a very smart, wonderful woman, and I know you know lots of things, but I'm going to tell you right now, (laughs) a little bit of mascara is not going to kill the dang boy. Make him have a mustache. He will be fine. He'll be cute. (laughs) You'll take pictures of it. You'll put it on your Instagram or your Facebook. You'll show all your friends in the grandmother circles you run in, (laughs) and they're going to love it. They're going to think it's cute, and you're going to be the hip grandma who you know helped make that happen. I'm telling you, Mama Shaw, mm-hmm. that's what's going to happen. You'll be mm-hmm. fine. He'll be fine. Preach. Okay, I'll get down off my soapbox then <laughs> for you. <laughs> so that's been that's been a, a part of our week is buying things and organizing things because you just never know when the baby's going to come. I mean, oh, yeah. He could come now and he'd be perfectly healthy and fine and ready to go. We're at that point. So It's like a movie where they've got the like, bomb and there's like the ticker and like you're like, oh, I know when it's going to come off. It's like a bomb, but you don't know when that thing's going to go off. There's no <laughs> so ticker. True. It's like, you're like, do I cut the red wire? Do I cut the blue wire? Which one? Uh, do I, eh, eh, eh. You and know, no. it's just going to happen when it happens. Yep. So I haven't been worrying about it too much, but Jesse's not worrying about it, but she's obviously thinking about it much more than, than oh, me. Yeah. And so she's wanting to get all the stuff in order. So we have got all the stuff out of storage that we had for Emmy and getting some new stuff for Lando and. So that's been kind of fun, though. It's always fun to think about having a new kid, as stressful and crazy as it is. So we're excited about it, and that's been fun. We did a we did a um, what do you, a fast food burger taste test challenge, like so, a like a blind taste test. Yes. Okay. So we went to five fast food chains. Okay. And it was me. So my my dad and my little brother were out of town this week. So my mom was by herself. So she came with us. It was my mom, Jesse, and myself. And we did this these six burgers and blindfolded and guessed and then rated them. And it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, so, I don't know if I should be proud or embarrassed that I in was the blind taste test. Pr- I was perfect, one hundred percent on. Like you knew what that what, what they were. Yes. Oh. So that we got all of the signature burgers. Okay. From each of the restaurants we went to. So like a Big Mac. We also got, so we got a Big Mac from McDonald's, but that's so obvious. We got the double quarter yeah. pounder okay. or the quarter pounder. Still. In, yeah. Instead. Okay. Then we got kind of the classic from everything else. Kind of pretty relatively consistent, like tomato and lettuce. And then if they have a sauce, they can put it on there. And then a cheese in the burger. Anyway, long story short, Everybody else was, or my mom was like 20%. Jesse was like 50%. And I was 100%. I'm not sure. Like I said, heck not yeah, sure you if should, I should heck be, yeah, you should be proud not, of that. But so, what were the uh, six restaurants? We went to McDonald's, uh-huh. Burger King. So, Whopper at Burger King? Yep, Whopper at Burger King. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, In and Out. Double, double. Regular. No, we got the just a cheeseburger. Okay. Um, we went to Whataburger. And just got Ooh, the Whataburger. I forget you have Whataburger in Texas. Oh, it's delicious. So you got the Whataburger with the egg on it, right? Nope. Just straight up, just kind straight of up. the Whataburger. And okay. then uh, Wendy's. And we got uh, whatever the number one usually is. We usually kind of stick with whatever the number that's, one is. That's so it's a like Dave's a Dave's single. Yep. The Dave's. That's what Brita gets all the time. She's like, I just want one of the, she's like, I want a single. Dave's single. Like, Perfect. All right. She's like, no onions. I'm like, oh, come on. Don't like, like, let's not do the, like, put this on it. Don't put this on. I'm like, just pick it off. Use your fingers. So we had a good okay. time with that. That was, that was a fun, a fun evening. So just thinking of what you said, I would get the Big Mac, the Whopper, I would get the Dave single mm-hmm. and let's see here. And the in and out I probably would get like if it was a double double, I would definitely get it for right. sure. Um, what would throw me would be the Whataburger. Cause I don't have one right. here and I haven't had that in probably 13, 14 years. Yep. And then what was the last one you said you went to? Gosh, in and out, Whataburger, McDonald's, yeah. Burger King. Um, I don't know what a burger Wendy's. Burger King, Wendy's. That's all of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I would have done. 
I think I've done pretty good. What I was wondering is if you were going to do like the blind taste test, like where you decide like which one you thought tasted better. So we did, I, we each, we rated them too. So okay. we made a guess as to where it was from and then we rated it. Okay. Um, and kind well, of, I what did What was the highest score. rated burger? The double quarter pounder from McDonald's. I don't know double. if you've had it recently, but no. the fresh meat, when they, when they changed it for the fresh, uh-huh. not frozen meat, Holy cow, man! That's a good freaking burger. Made the difference, huh? Like I knew, what, I knew what all of them were when I ate it, and so I tried to be as unbiased as possible, even though I knew what it mm-hmm. was. And I mean, it's just good. It's wow. just good. It's a good burger, but that's not to say I think second place was um, I'm trying to remember. I think it was Whataburger though, but I'm not. I'm not 100 percent on that. My recollection of Whataburger is pretty good. Also, Fat Burger. Fat I don't know. If, burger. I don't know if they have one there in Texas, but they've got a Mm-mm. they've got a Fat Burger. I think it's like Southern California, Arizona, but that's good. That's a good burger too. I am open to any and all burgers. You can we keep have... that Five Guys though. I don't want that. No, Five Guys. I don't. Is it's where's too... that from? Is that an Idaho place? I know they get their potatoes from Idaho, but I don't know. It's too greasy for me. I'm not a huge fan, and it's uh... so expensive for what you get. I'm just like, agreed, man. I'd rather go. There's a number of places I'd rather go. Yep. Than Five Guys. I haven't had great experiences there. Hmm. So you did the burger challenge with yeah, Mama Shaw, fun. Jesse, and Emmy. Mm-hmm. What did Emmy think of the burgers? Emmy loves cheeseburgers, man. She she yeah. took down a whole McDonald's cheeseburger, no problem. And I bet you she loves bacon cheeseburgers. Eh? <laughs> she's, eh? never, she's never had bacon on <laughs> Matt, a no, come on now. She's, All right. I'm just happy she's eating a meat. She <laughs> just She is a vegetarian. Oh my gosh. She eats dairy and veggies and fruits, just not meat. I mean, really? Hmm. So when I can get meat in any form into her body, I'm happy. And cheeseburger, hey, might so not be what, the healthiest way. What you have but... to do is you show her the piece of bacon and you know she'll eat bacon. <laughs> yep, she does eat she, bacon. And then show her the cheeseburger. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. Look, look. <gasps> Put yeah. it together. I'm like, it's amazing. And then just yeah. have her try it. Yep. And she'll she'll eat it and her eyes will light up. And you will have a convert so. to the meat church. I hope so, man. Mm. She's she's too stubborn. Uh, you never know what's going to happen with her. She'll love it. <laughs> she'll hate it. I, I don't know. She is. It's so. Yeah. Did I she's, did I tell you that I've been teaching the boys like we only get food from two places, plants and animals, and uh-uh. so when they eat meat, they're like, "Daddy, this is pulled pork." I'm like, "What's pulled pork?" And they go. Oink, oink. I'm like, you're right, it's pig. And then they'll, <laughs> they're like, what is ribs? I'm like, well, what is ribs? And I'm like, oink, oink. I'm like, it is, um, but sometimes, sometimes it's... Sometimes, yeah. Moo. <laughs> and so like, they'll ask about steak, and they'll ask about like burnt ends and brisket. And so yeah. like, I'm I'm just making sure my kids know like, because I don't want them to have a surprise because, you know, some yeah, people no are like, oh, like, I'm eating a chicken. This yeah. is a little chicken from the barnyard. You're like, yeah. where, where do you think those nuggets come from? Right. It's not the magic nugget fairy. Yeah. They're called chicken yeah. nuggets. <laughs> Just saying. Truth. That's yep. a good idea. Yeah, it's it's fun because I make it a game. So like they, you know, they get to like make animal noises and whatnot. And so then they're yeah. not going to be freaked out later when they find out like many, many animals were slaughtered to yes. feed you all that beef and chicken growing up. Mm-hmm. Especially chicken. Good night. Those so kids much can chicken. Eat so many chicken nuggets. All the chickens. Hmm. Sorry. Chickens. So, anything else going on? I mean, I know we're like tangenting, probably because I'm hungry. Uh, we're tangenting on food this week, but anything else? Not really. It was just kind of a standard week outside of that, just working and playing and watching yep. more Seinfeld, getting through that with Jesse and nice. I YouTube nice. TV is fantastic. We have YouTube TV. That's what we use instead of cable. And uh-huh. it'll automatically record all these movies and stuff. I don't have to set it to. It just kind of has a movie thing, and it will record pretty much any and all movies that ever show up on any of my channels. So there's a whole bunch of movies that I either never got around to see or edited for content and stuff like that that I now get to watch. That's okay. been really fun. So just kind of burning through a bunch of things that I know are really popular. Like I watched Django Unchained. Mm, yeah, I saw that movie like and a while back. I was like, hey, very good. Jamie Foxx. Yeah. I like this. I like Jamie Foxx. I, I watched some other ones, so it's been fun. Nice. 
I uh, I am looking forward to getting a normal week. Like I haven't streamed Spider Man in a couple of weeks now, just because of the work situation. I haven't I haven't played anything. Yeah, I haven't really been watching anything. Uh, I'm still listening to uh, the Wheel of Time series. I'm on the Dragon Reborn, the third book. I've been listening to that like on 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 and off, like to to work and back. Mm-hmm. But yeah, man, I'm looking forward to a normal week. But what do you say we do something normally that we do every week, and we just do it again this week, and we just murder some yeah, freaking bodies? brutally, brutally. Let's do it. I always have to let you know, many Bothans died to bring us this information. Rest in peace, you Bothans. All right, Matt, we brutally murdered Bothans. Uh, I'm still covered in blood, so it's a little disgusting. I'm going to go wash my hands, but Mm. here's the thing. Because I've been working so much, you graciously stepped up and said, I, Matt Shaw, am going to put together all the Rebel Intelligence. Yes. So you get to kick off Rebel Intelligence, and you get to basically run the show of Rebel Intelligence because uh, I don't know what's going on this week, man. I mean, we murdered those Bothans, but I didn't understand what they were saying. (laughs) You know what? Have no fear. I'm fluent in Bothan. So Ah, good. Perfect. Speaking of Star Wars... Just like last week, we're going to start it off with Star Wars. This is the biggest, most favorite thing of the week for me. This was super exciting. Ewan McGregor is reportedly returning as Obi-Wan Kenobi in a Disney Plus series. Get out. This is, at first, I that was my reaction at first. Because I read it and I was like, I've heard these rumors before about an Obi-Wan movie. And I know Ewan yeah. McGregor wants to come back. He's made yep. that apparent yeah he's talked about Um, that a few times and i read this one i was like maybe and then it started to get more and more traction and more and more credible news sources started reporting it and now it they've almost taken the word reportedly out and they're like ewan mcgregor is reprising his role wow Um, and the jar jar binks voice actor like tweeted about it and said congratulations welcome back to a galaxy far far It, it, it was it's all very exciting so there's no official word from disney yet i think we can expect it Mm-hmm. At D23, if it's true, I, I'm pretty sure it is. It's getting too much traction for me to believe it's not. Right. But this to me is like shockingly exciting. And there are so many ways I think that they could they could take this series. So do you think this is going to be like, would well, pick up shortly after like Order 66? Or do you think this is going to be more like older obi-wan kenobi and maybe some of the things that he got up to while like watching over luke on tatooine yeah i'm thinking more of the tatooine okay i'm hoping that here's my here's my dream okay they tie in solo a star wars story into what we're gonna see with obi-wan i want to see the crimson dawn darth maul the inner the the crazy stuff that happens on tatooine because it's obviously an important planet in the star wars universe and for our characters and We know that Han's been there many times. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to intermingle a lot of these stories. They could do all sorts of cool stuff. But that would be my my dream is to have all of these characters and not not just I mean, I'd love just an Obi-Wan thing, but Right. Well the other thing too is like you could show a very young Luke Skywalker. Like you could maybe show you could show him like kind of being watched over maybe like some like chance interactions with Ben. Yeah. Because if you remember in A New Hope um, when he says, you know, Obi Wan Kenobi's like, Obi Wan Kenobi's like, does he mean old Ben? Like, so you know that, like, yeah. and somehow, like, Luke knows Ben Kenobi. Maybe not like closely, but maybe you know he knows he's the old hermit that lives out beyond the mm-hmm. Dune Sea. So like, maybe he's had some interactions with him. Maybe he's run into him in like you know Anchorhead or Mos Eisley or yep. something like that. Yep. Which. I think is freaking it's, awesome that so like cool. they could t- they could do this and they could tie things in in a way like Rogue One did where like Rogue One told its own story yes but had these things that like lined up with other stuff but it didn't change the story but it just made like a deeper appreciation of what we already love right yep mm. I, there's a lot of potential here I think I don't know I get myself too excited when I start thinking about this. I loved Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi in the prequels. I mean, he's one of those bright spots I think everyone in the Star Wars universe can agree on. 
Ewan McGregor was fantastic as Obi-Wan. And so this is really, I don't know, it gets my heart race and I'm super excited and hopeful that this comes to fruition. And, uh, and I do hope that they tie, uh, they'll, they'll tie these things in. And if I don't see a Darth Maul at some point over the course of the series, I will be very disappointed. You know what I'd love to see, which I don't think they would do it. Flashbacks with Qui-Gon Jinn. Oh man. Leo. Oh, cause, cause Qui-Gon Jinn, I loved his character in Phantom Menace. And I awesome. wish we could have explored that more. Agreed. Mm. And Liam Neeson never ages. I mean, come on. We could do all sorts of stuff. With, neither does Ian McGregor. They could go back and do episode one again. None of us would even know the difference. None of us would care if we rebooted that one. No, I mm-hmm. wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't mind it. But we're not here to talk about that. Yeah, that's the nah, exciting news. Know. So that's that is news that is item. cool. That's so yeah. When's D23 again? Remind me. That's like another this week or two, right? And okay, this weekend. It's like in a couple days. By the time this podcast comes out, it's tomorrow, I think. So there's a good chance we could be hearing stuff about this and talking about it maybe next week. Yes, that's the hope. Mm, It's pretty exciting. So that was part one of Disney. Part two and three. Well, we'll start with this one. So Hong Kong's a crazy place these days. I don't know if all of our super friends are up to date on what's happening in Hong Kong, but there's all sorts of protests going on. Ooh, are we going to get like a little world politics corner here? Like a well, culture where we're going to learn something about I don't know the enough. Orient? I don't know enough to... Uh, to how, how did this conflict begin, Matt Shaw? How did it begin? Tell us now, please. So Go. a young... I don't know. <laughs> um, long story short, the government is being protested by the okay. citizens of Hong Kong. Thousands. Hong Kong airport being shut down by sit-in and stand-in and all of these massive protests because they want... Free to, like, they want complete independence, have. right? They want, yeah, well, they want to have a democracy. They want to have, they want to be westernized. I mean, they're, some of them are carrying American flags. I mean, they, they want. Because Hong Kong, uh, if I remember, Hong Kong was under British control up until like 98 or 99. And it's like the one part of China that was under British control still like forever. And so it's very westernized already. Yeah. And I think that. But but then like I can't remember if it was like after ninety eight or after ninety nine, then control of Hong Kong got turned back over to mainland China, as part of like some agreement. Um, and so I think, from what I remember, I think that these protests and demonstrations are all for like complete independence from mainland China, and being their own like country or something, right? Sure. I think yes. that's what it is. They're I'm, protesting I'm pretty sure. because they want freedom. I'm not sure okay. all of the details, but yeah, sh- yes to that. Good. So okay. go ahead. This, this all makes sense here. So these protesters and those that support uh, the many Americans, I, I see it all over it all the time. There, there's a lot of people supporting this movement in Hong Kong from the citizens. Anyway, the protesters are calling for Disney's or to boycott Disney's Mulan because the main actress who's playing Mulan is supporting the Hong Kong police. Hmm. Saying, you know, how, how basically this is kind of embarrassing and shameful. And many of them, the protesters, are calling her out and calling out the, the movie to be boycotted. So... Uh, Mulan was probably expected to be a relatively big hit in China. I mean, it's a story about like I would imagine. Um, and so I'm not sure what this is going to mean or if it's going to be forgotten by the time Mulan rolls around next year. However, yeesh. Yeah. So uh, we've kind of talked about this before, this whole like rage and outrage culture and, uh, if this is the actress speaking, like, not on behalf of, like, Disney, not on right. behalf of, like, w- just talking as herself, like, I think boycotting an entire movie, all the work of, you know, multiple actors and actresses, the yeah. work of directors and, you know, stage hands and crewmen and electricians and, you know, makeup artists, like, boycotting all that work that they, that they put into a movie, I think is kind of overkill because one actress has a political opinion and she's right. not afraid to share it. Yeah. I think, I think we need to, I think in this world, this is just me. I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a second. I think in this world, we need to treat 
uh, listening to celebrities, actors, you know, musicians, like we take listening to anyone else that has an idea. Just because they're in the spotlight or they make a lot of money because they're talented or skilled at, you know, making funny faces or telling jokes or, you know, playing a great guitar or singing great doesn't mean that that they're necessarily any more informed or any more educated on a topic than anyone else. It's just that they have a larger platform from which to share their ideas or, you know, opinions. Um, And so I, I really think we need to get out of the habit of like, idolizing these people and like thinking that what they say like you know really matters because the reality is is like you know if she's you know on the side of the government that's just that's her opinion she's entitled to have an opinion right and should that mean that like you know you shouldn't go see some work that she's a part of but like then you're not supporting everyone else that did it and especially in a place where like this is China. How many big movies for Disney, like Disney what movies are based out of China? Like this is it. Yeah. This is the one. Yeah. And they have a chance of like, you know, making it extremely successful and popular mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and sharing a story that's, you know, important to the Chinese people with more people throughout the world. Why set this precedent? Right. Yep. That's just me. That's my soapbox. That's where I'm at. Like, don't boycott things just because one person has an opinion. Just disagree with that person's opinion and move on. Well said. Unless they've like murdered people, then you know maybe that's a that's that. an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah, we yeah, might want to yeah adjust our stance. Okay. So talking <laughs> uh, talking about um, Disney still, and oh, wow. we'll probably talk a lot about Disney next week too. Been in the news a lot. Um, Disney Plus coming up. People are excited. Yeah. Um, they, however, Disney and um, I believe it is Comcast are going to are working together to crack down on password sharing. So, okay. like Netflix, people share their passwords; they share their accounts with other people. Disney yeah. and Comcast are working on a way to mitigate that what they're calling piracy. Um, a little extreme, but basically finding a way to make it so that the accounts are not being shared across a variety of places and individuals. Hmm. I wonder how they're going to do that. Like based on like, like number of logins per IP, because obviously like, how so like do that. Well, cause like, so let's say you log into your Netflix at home, right? Right. It's, it's going to log into like whatever device, like you're on an Apple yep. TV or a Roku or whatever. It's going to connect through the public IP address you get assigned by Comcast or Charter or AT&T or whoever you've got, right? Time Warner or whatever. And so they're going to see, oh, here's a connection from this IP address. Well, then if, you know, Mama Shaw, who lives, you know, let's say, I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes away, mm-hmm. logs in with your password... They're going to notice, oh, it's from a different IP address. And it, it's kind of easy to do a backtrace scheme like, oh, it's this and that. You know, I think where that gets difficult, maybe like mobile stuff, right? Yeah. Because super difficult then. If you're logging in from like your cell phone on your data plan, it's going to yeah. get a different, a completely different IP. But if you were logging in from your Wi Fi, it's the same public IP that's assigned to your, you know, modem or router. Right. So I wonder, I wonder if that's kind of what they're going to do. But it's going to have then, to be. But then, how do you like? What if like you're traveling, right? Like, let's say you travel for business, and Jesse's mm-hmm. home, and you're both logged in at the same time. Like, right. they're going to have to do something to like be like you know some sort of authentic authentication yeah. or something. Yep, yep. I'm I'm not sure, and then the article is unclear. They don't know yet either. They also probably don't charter, want to by tell. The way. This is not Comcast. This is okay, Charter. charter. I, I I I misspoke. Okay. Um, but it, they would have to do some type of IP address tracking um, to be able to do this. YouTube TV does something similar where you can't share always across like state lines. So when I'm in Montana and I log into my YouTube TV, I only have access to a certain amount of channels and the rest of them are disabled. Hmm. Um, I, I wonder, I mean... The, the I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I guess they could do it by geographic area. 
by saying, okay, you live in this zip code, only this zip code can have access. I, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. But if you're thinking of sharing a password, beware. Yeah. Beware. Interesting. You heard it here first on the Fortress of Nerditude. Do not share passwords. Don't do it. For All Disney right. Plus. <laughs> yeah, just for Disney. Netflix, you're chill. They seem to be okay with it as long as you got the right plan. Anyway. All right, so this is news today. Okay, breaking this morning. news. Hold on. Beep, 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 breaking beep, 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 Okay, go ahead. Sony <laughs> has acquired Insomniac Games. <gasps> the guys that made Spider-Man. The guys that made Ooh. Spider-Man, Ratchet and Clank. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see, what else did they make? They made the uh, the Batman games, right? Like the Arkham Knight games and... I believe so. Is that the same studio, Insomniac? I think so. Yes, so they made, okay, yeah, Ratchet and Clank. We're trying to get a list here. But anyway, regardless, they're a big studio yeah. uh, that's been acquired by um, by Sony. So another big get for for Sony. They've got a lot of, they, they've kind of been the king of exclusives yeah, uh, this as generation. far as their platform is concerned. I mean, other than Nintendo, they do their own thing. That's right. cool. They make their own stuff. But this is, I mean, this is a pretty big deal for Insomniac Games, obviously. But for Sony and gaming in general, all, 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 all things coming from Insomniac will now be Sony exclusive. Wow. Very interesting. That is big, big, big news. And it seems like, you know, E3 wasn't that long ago. So, like, you would have thought maybe they would have announced something then, but... You know, kind of holding so, off that news for a while. Yeah, they announced it this morning. Well, it happened during Gamescom this morning. Oh, that makes sense. So they kind of, and there was a whole bunch of stuff showed at Gamescom. I know you haven't had a chance to see nope. a lot of that, yep. view any of that. They had, they had some cool stuff. They had Death Stranding gameplay and uh, a lot of cool information. They had uh, The Witcher 3 being shown for the first time gameplay for the switch and all sorts mm. of cool little things. So you can go how, back. How and, did that look on the switch? Uh, when I saw the trailer, I was like, wow, this looks like crap. Really? And then I started to watch gameplay and I, well, I'm watching it on a big screen while it's oh. streaming and they're showing me handheld footage. And so yeah. I'm like, mm. when I saw it on my laptop and I was watching actual gameplay from like the developers. Yeah. It, it looked much better. And it ran really smooth, and all of the all of the uh, journalists and kind of YouTube channels that I watch have been praising it. So it, it runs consistent. It hangs on at the same like frame rates. There's very few slowdowns. It holds up with the PS4 from a frame rate perspective. Obviously, the resolution isn't what it was, um, but the game is all intact all on a 32-bit cartridge with no day one download. It's one of those those marvels like Doom and Wolfenstein for the Switch where you go, how did they even do that? Magic. Magic, so, I tell you. Uh, anyway, lots of cool gaming news today, but that was certainly probably the biggest um, an acquisition. So good for Sony. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's cool. Uh, I actually have one little thing. Woo-hoo! So su- surprise, surprise. And I saw this just like right before we started. Um, so when I grew up, there was a cartoon that I was a big fan of. It was He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Prince Adam of Eternia would hold up his sword and he would say, I have the power. And he would turn into He-Man and be muscular and fight Skeletor. And I, I swear it's one of those cartoons that was only designed to sell action figures, and I'm pretty sure that's exactly what it was. <laughs> um, but Netflix has had She-Ra and the Princesses of Power for some time now, and apparently at PowerCon, Netflix revealed that Kevin Smith is going to be executive producing Masters of the Universe Revelation. It's a new series based on He-Man and the Masters hmm. of the Universe. They're going to do some storylines that they said was like unresolved story arcs from the original and they said it's going to be a limited series so i don't know what that means i don't know if that means like it's going to be like a one and done like series or if it's going to be only a few episodes Mm -hmm. and then maybe like another few episodes like not a not what you'd consider like a full season okay but i'm excited by this because i loved that as a kid and if 
if something like this comes back and like my kids had a chance to watch it, uh, seeing a younger generation get invested in an intellectual property that like you were invested as, as a kid yep. and see it kind of come back like the Ninja Turtles did. Like I remember the original Ninja Turtle cartoons and like they've been rebooted like two or three times now and like other generations have got to enjoy that. Yep. I think that's cool. I, I completely agree. I didn't watch He-Man. But I'm excited. I showed my daughter this morning. I showed her the trailer for the Dark Crystal series that's coming to Netflix that's releasing at the end of the month. And the Dark Crystal was like a huge part of my childhood. It just blew me away. My imagination was activated. And I showed it to her this morning. She was going, oh, bad guys. Wow. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And I said, Emmy, you want to watch this with me? She's like, yeah, let's watch it right now. And I was like, okay, it's not out yet. However, when it does come out, girl, we got some watching to do. Mm -hmm. So I I agree. I think it's cool to see things that we grew up with that are being rebooted. I I get the reboot. It's happening all the time. Yeah. But it's because all of these things that were you know that were popular and it's 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 fun. We all we have kids now. We want to enjoy something similar that makes us feel a certain way yep so i'm in i think it's cool good for netflix yeah i i think it's i think it's interesting i think it's exciting and uh i can't wait but anyway i snuck that little thing in i I saw it like literally (laughs) two minutes before the podcast and i felt i had to bring something to the table so thank you for your offering it has been accepted nice nice uh let's see here uh last week matt we had a wonderful conversation we talked about spoilers and this Oh, I, yeah. AI spoiler net. And we asked a question like, how long oh. does the spoiler warning, like should you give spoiler warnings before like movies and TV and then like how long before video games? And so we got a couple answers. So I thought we'll start where we always do, which is our email, which is fordhamnerd at gmail.com. And we have Peter Christensen. He says, dear nerds, I think the movie The Hunt sounds terrible and is a terrible idea. But there's an interesting contrast with suppressing this movie versus the push to see the interview out of principle after North Korea hacked Sony and released their sensitive documents, Mm. which, yeah, I mean, it it, it is interesting contrast. Uh, He says, I work at Amazon, but don't know anything about their movie slash TV productions. Oh, Peter, I'm so sad. Devastated. Not that you work, not that you work at Amazon, but like you know, you're not going to give us any hints into the Lord of the Rings or the Wheel of Time. But he says, I do know that Amazon is famous for starting small with a plan for how to evaluate success, and then confidently doubles down on projects that hit their success metrics. Obviously, the ultimate measure of the success for Lord of the Rings show will be viewership and effect on Prime subscriptions but they must be very pleased with their intermediate success milestone to have a 20 episode season yeah. one. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's awesome. That the buzz is good enough to, to justify that. Uh, he goes on to say GI Joe rise of Cobra was actually a pretty fun action movie. <laughs> I would put it on the Mount Rushmore of enjoyable, unnecessary nostalgia remakes along with Creed Cobra Kai and transformers. Hmm. The Baroness storm shadow and snake eyes were especially good. The sequel, G.I. Joe Retaliation, was one of the worst, most boring action movies I have ever (laughs) seen. Worse than any sequel to Transformers or Pirates of the Caribbean, and The Rock was one of the worst parts of it. I'm willing to roll the dice again. Oh, okay. So he hated, loved the first one, thought it was a lot of fun, just kind of, you know, an action movie. Hated the second one, but willing to roll the dice again. So Peter's a little bit of a gambler here. Yeah, I like it. I thought the spoiler detector project was interesting. I have a good idea of how machine learning works, but I'm still surprised by the novel applications. I agree that you have a responsibility to avoid spoilers, which we do. He says, I held on to episode 140 until we finished Stranger Things season three this week. I try to avoid even the non-spoiler discussions because I'm very susceptible to other impressions, to others' impressions. Mm. I think the limits of two weeks for a big movie event or a flagship show like Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, and two months for shows and smaller movies. When it comes to games, I promise to never spoil a game, nor be upset if a game is spoiled for me. It says, to end your suspense, I did get a Traeger from Costco. <gasps> oh my he says, gosh. 
but we're not on good terms because it's not heating up. Oh, oh my gosh. So that sweet, sweet smoked meat will have to wait. Jesus, cheers, Peter Christensen. Now, Peter, you got it at Costco, man. Return that thing. <laughs> they will get you a brand new one, and they will hook you up. Um, he does go on to say, this is kind of like an answer to the previous question. It says, P.S., Stranger Things Season 3 loved Robin and the Bald Eagle. I agree that they did a great job with Billy, and the sauna yeah. fight was the high point of the season's intensity. Yeah. I felt like they went to the Schwarzenegger store. Oh, sorry. I did not care for Grigori, the super Russian. I felt like they mm-hmm. went to the Schwarzenegger store, but only brought rubles. I'm mm-hmm. impressed at how they can make essentially the same monster, but vary it enough to be surprising and fresh each season. It started slow, but picked up around episode four and turned into a great season. Also, I'll have to watch that video with the homage, with the homages uh, in the show. I oh, recognize yes. the T-1000, the hobbits hiding under the tree roots, the T-Rex chase, probably many more. Yes, many more. Go watch it. It's a Go great watch that little video. And take that thing back to Costco and get one that works. <laughs> do not, oh, do not, do not wait, Peter. Smoked meat is in your future, my, fr- my brother. All right, let's move on, because I'm hungry, and I if we start talking about smoking meat, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a goner. Uh, Facebook, facebook.com slash Florida Nerd. We got Caleb Albers. He says, so my frame of reference when I talk about new movies or video games is s- with someone is typically led up with a have you seen or have you played question. Yeah. With movies, it's o- I know it's okay to talk about the entire thing with them. With games... I need to lead with more questions like, have you finished it or what part are you at? Then I know what I can and can't talk about. But that's just a private conversation. For the masses with movies, I'd say two weeks after a movie has come out is a good time to allow spoilers. And for games, it's a bit tougher because people play games at their own pace. Not everyone's going to play the same way either. For example, my buddy Rose and I have been playing Red Dead Redemption 2. Mm. He only plays the main story while I go through all the side missions and quests before oh getting to gosh, the main story. Caleb, how can you possibly do all of that? <laughs> I'm so impressed. Uh, right. Good job. He, good for you. He says, so I'm going to say with video games, there shouldn't be a spoiler lift on, on them. Any video or online discussion about it should have a spoiler warning before it. So he's saying two weeks on big movies and then like like no embargo lifting on spoilers for video games. So that's fair. He makes a good point about like the he only plays like his buddy Rose only plays main stories, but he yeah. plays like all the side and the main because, yeah, on a big RPG type of game, even though I know Red Dead Redemption 2 is kind of like a Western RPG, not like a, a Japan like right. JRPG. Um yeah, like, yeah, you totally could have different experiences and different playthrough times. So that totally makes sense. Yep. Uh, Tim Pollan says, I've thought about this a lot. Since I changed positions at work, since I changed positions at work, I have a lot less time for both. Plus, my oldest can drive now, so he and his brother will go while I'm at work, i.e. far from home. Really? I feel like that... I also feel like I don't know what question he's answering there. Maybe from another one. But then he says, sorry, I forgot to answer. Ha ha. Movie spoilers. A few months. If you didn't go see it in the theaters, that's on you for waiting for the Blu-ray. Games are a harder line to draw. I'm still trudging through a ton of old games. Luckily, I'm getting old and forgetful. Spoil away. I'll most likely not remember. In either, kind, <laughs> in e- in either case, be kind and ask first. I think that's the best advice. That is, absolutely. Be kind I mean, and what's ask the point? first. Why are you gonna yeah. spoil it, man? I I I love his answer I love his you know answer to this. I'm still a little befuddled by what the first one was. I'll have Look, to go back and like listen to the I podcast don't know, and see. But all I know is that his kids went to go see Far From Home without him. That's basically what I got out of that. And it was really rude. Oh, maybe that's when we were talking about like do you go by yourself or like you always go with someone else because remember i said like breed and i sometimes will go mm. individually because mm. you know the kids and this and that maybe yeah. maybe that's what we're talking about tim i think we puzzled it out i think we got it well regardless you raised them they should have more respect for you and you should be able to go see movies with them i mean how dare yes. they sometimes they'll see the movie by yourself is quite nice i agree it is, it is quite enjoyable like you know it what? is i don't have to worry about anyone else 
no one's going to be stealing my jujubes or my milk duds or popcorn or whatever you're into. Like, it's just you, the movie, and like, you know, a whole bunch of strangers. Yeah, I love the strangers that <laughs> smell like body odor and smoke. It's my favorite. Well, I try not to focus on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, going over to Twitter, we have, did I say something wrong at D-I-S-S-W cast? So did I say something wrong cast? Nine months. Wow. That's a pregnancy. So a movie comes out. If you conceive on opening night, when the baby's born, (laughs) then you can talk about the movie. Wow. Okay. I mean. So, Matt, you should go back and you should see what was like a big movie, like around the time Lando was conceived real quick. And then we'll just say like, we can't talk about that movie until Lando is born. Oh, Real well, quick, while you're doing that, it would be it would be uh, December of last year. All right. So what came out in December in... of 2018? I figure there's got to be some relatively big ones. So while you look that up, I just want to say, Super Friends, thank you so much for your interaction. We love talking to you each and every week. Uh, it's it's one of our favorite parts of the podcast. It really truly is. So you keep those answers that coming, and we will keep discussing your answers. And uh, chit-chatting about that. So, uh, Matt, super friends are out there. They're listening to the podcast week in and week out. What can they do to help us this week? Y'all know, go to iTunes, subscribe, and leave a five-star review. If you think we're five-star worthy, if you think we're two-star worthy, leave a five-star review. Uh, and tell kinda, us privately. <laughs> yeah, just uh, leave us a voice message and... <laughs> that's 801-477-7687 yeah just call that number and leave us a flamogram and uh leave us a five-star review no big deal so okay five-star review no matter you like it or not okay so december 2018 what was like the big movie okay so it depends on who you are i guess <gasps> oh but... i can take a guess spider-man into the spider-verse yes yes so okay. good we can't talk about it but yeah, we can't talk like about it until weeks. lando's born even oh, though I'm pretty so sure good, we've though. already talked about it, you and I, but oh. we can't mention it. We cannot mention that movie again on the podcast until Lando's born. No, my gosh, I'm going to cry. So I went okay. and saw this really cool movie last December about, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and it was awesome. Great animation. Oh, <laughs> spoiled it. It's got animation. I don't know. Uh, oh, well. That, that could be anyway. like a, a Disney movie then, maybe. I don't know. It yeah. could be. Nine months, though. That's a, a long, long time. time. Yeah, yeah. That's a long time. All right, Matt, so this week you graciously suggested that we should do a movie club. And we've, we've and on this podcast and throughout its history, we have done new movies. Like we talked about Far From Home when it came out. And then we've also talked about like older movies or movies that maybe have been out for a little while. But this week, because you knew that I was going to be stuck in this like place of just like nonstop work, you said, let's pick an older movie. Something that you know that I've seen a thousand times. So we could still have a movie club and we could talk about a movie, but I didn't have to like try to find a way to drag myself to the theater. So what is the movie you chosen for us to talk about tonight? We are going to discuss The Fellowship of the Ring. Ooh, yes, that I can do. And I think most of our listeners are intimately familiar with the source material and the film. So, so we can all fun. play along, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so kick us off. So, uh, what do you want to talk about first with the Fellowship of the Ring? Okay. So, actually, okay. I don't know if this is fair, but I am just curious to see of the three Lord of the Rings films. We're not counting the Hobbit here. Out of the three Lord of the Rings films, where does Fellowship land? One, two, number, three. Number one. Number one. Same for me. Number one. Number one. I I love all three films uh, tremendously. So, a little bit of back backstory. I. When I was a young kid, I remember watching the old Rankin and Bass 1978 Hobbit cartoon <laughs> yes. with with my cousins who were like eight and ten years older than me. And so I remember watching it when I was maybe like seven, eight years old, somewhere around there. Yeah. And and I remember like really liking that and enjoying that. And I have memories of like watching it in my aunt's house downstairs in their living room on like a Saturday morning. And so 
they they were into it. They really liked it. So therefore, I wanted to be cool like my cousins. So I said I liked it. And so like I watched it. And then I'd watch it again and again. But it really made me want to kind of get into this. And then I remember when I got into like junior high, I had to like pick books to read. And yeah. one of them was The Hobbit. I was like, oh, I'll choose that. I've seen that cartoon. It'll be easy to write mm-hmm. the, the book review based off the cartoon. And because I was, you know, in junior high and not wanting to do homework. And I read the book and I loved it. I loved yeah. it, loved it, loved it. And then, of course... I got into high school. I started reading the entire Lord of the Rings. I've pretty much read the Lord of the Rings every year since then. So Amazing. We're talking like close That's to 25 years now. So it's one of my favorite books. Uh, Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, uh, is the high watermark in the fantasy uh, genre, and especially kind of like the high fantasy. Right. So I was excited for this movie. Like I... I've been excited about a lot of things. Like, you know, I get excited for like the new Avengers movie or the new Spider-Man yeah. movie. And I've, I've been with those, you know, characters. I've read those comics, but for me, this was like, this was yeah. an event that was like, you know, some, you know, 20 years in the making for me, for me. And I know if there's other fans that like read these books when they were written, like, back in like the 1950s when they were released. So right. for them, it was, you know, like a 50 year thing. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, great, great source material, a lot of stuff. But for me, fellowship. Completely. Fellowship is the best of the three of the films Yep. for a lot of reasons. I, uh, I agree. I think the fellowship is very... I don't know. We'll get into some of the details here as to, at least for me, why it's why it's my favorite of those of that franchise, and really one of my favorite just movies of all time, probably in my top ten. I just really, really, really love the love those movies, and especially the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, but obviously, I here's my exposure to Lord of the Rings prior to the movies coming out was this one dude that I thought was a nerd in my middle school class, always talking about this elf named Legolas and how cool he was. And I was like, wow, (laughs) shut up nerd. Like give me a break. I remember his name too, Patrick Temporelli. Shout out to Patrick. If you're listening, you're not probably drunk somewhere. Anyway. Um, so he would sit there (laughs) <laughs> he would he would talk about the Lord of the Rings all of the time, and it made me not like it because he was so obsessed with it. But anyway, okay. nonetheless, I was very very excited to see this movie once I saw the trailer. I was young. Uh, I'm trying to remember when this. Do you know off the top of your head? Two thousand one. Okay, two thousand one. So I was about thirteen years old, dating myself here. I'm thirty one. Um, I was twenty one at the time, so yep. I was super excited when I saw the trailer and I realized what it was really about, and it was this epic sweeping story with these really odd characters, and um, it was a midnight showing that I, I mean, I saw them all all at midnight, and it was anyway. The lead up was very very exciting. Yeah. So, tell me, um, <clears throat> well, thoughts on? We'll kind of get into s- some of these nitty gritty details, but thoughts on just the overall cast okay um so i've since i've known these characters you know for a long 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 time i kind of had an idea of like what they looked like in my mind okay and while at first and i know people are gonna like you know think i'm crazy when i say this um at, at first when ian mckellen shows up as gandalf that's not how I pictured Gandalf. Also because of the way he's described in the book and then also what I remember seeing from the Hobbit, you know, 1978 Rankin and okay. Bass Hobbit. Um, I remember what he looked like. He, he looked a little more grizzled, a little more gnarly, a little more like kind of like Merlin sorcerer living out in the woods Okay. Uh, versus what Ian McKellen looked like. But I mean – I think Ian McKellen played him amazingly. Now I, now when I read the book, even though the description is a l- slightly a little different, I, I have a hard time seeing anyone other than Ian McKellen. Like, yeah, he, I, th- I thought he was great. Um, I thought the, I thought the casting of, um, oh, what's his name, Ian Holm as the older Bilbo was amazing because. Hmm. 
I always had this, you know, kind of what I you know thought of Bilbo, and then kind of like older Bilbo, um, the Hobbits, Elijah Wood, and Billy Boyd, and Dominic Monaghan, and Sean Astin. Um, I thought were really really good. I think, um, I think Elijah Wood was the perfect Frodo. Yeah, I think he was the perfect Frodo. Sean Astin, though, for me, is hard to see as anyone other than Sean Astin because I've known him, like, my entire life. I mean, he was a child actor in The Goonies. Right. Uh, you know, so, like, you know, Rudy. I mean, just a bunch of different things that I've seen him in. I mean, he was in Stranger Things Season 2. Of course, I was, <laughs> you know, after. But um, So, for me, his Samwise didn't match up so much to my what I thought he would look like from the book just because he's just Sean Astin to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I but the rest that. like Orlando Bloom as Legolas, I thought was great. Christopher Lee as Saruman. I thought was amazing casting. Uh, Hugo weaving playing Lord Elrond was great. Uh, Sean Bean as Boromir, uh, John Reese Davies as, uh, Gimli and then Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn. Like, Ah, gosh, like, so good. Like, I thought Aragorn was cast very well. And, like, I don't remember Viggo Mortensen from, like, I know he did other things, but, like, I really don't remember him from doing anything else prior right. to, the, to these movies. Right. So, I think the casting was great. I think the casting director, whoever that was, I, I don't know if it was, you know, part of the kind of the big team of, like, Fran Walsh and Peter Jackson you know, Philip Boyens. I don't know if like it was all them, but whoever was the casting director on this film, I think did a heck of a job. I, I couldn't agree more except that I, the advantage I had is I hadn't read the source material yet. Yeah. This yeah. is what got me excited about Lord of the Rings. So all of these characters, it was all like unfolding to me. The story was unfolding to me with every moment and so my introduction to Gandalf was, oh, cool. It was, I, I didn't have anything to compare him to. Sure. But, yeah, yeah. But, you know, when I watched Harry Potter, I had a similar experience to you, right? That's not how Harry looks. That's certainly right. not how Hermione looks, et cetera. Um, now, though, after seeing now eight films. Now I can't not see yeah. Daniel yeah. Radcliffe and Emma Watson when I'm, when I'm reading the books. Right. So yeah. I, I get that. Um, and Sean Astin, I understand but at 13 years old, I'd, I'd seen The Goonies a handful of times, and I had definitely seen Rudy, but I couldn't have cared less about him being cast as Samwise. I was into it. Just a, like a weird side thing, like the whole idea of like, now you've seen someone play a role, now you can't think of it anything other. For me, that's also the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston as <laughs> Moses, because we'd watch that every year around like April, oh you know, Easter. So like for some reason, like if I die and there is a heaven and I go to heaven and Moses is in heaven... If he doesn't look like Charlton Heston, I'm going to be disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying. Anyway. Faith shaking. Um, <laughs> but the casting's really great. I mean, uh, you know all the names of all of these yeah. individuals. I just call them Mary and Pippin and Sam. <laughs> right. I mean, Elijah Wood and Sean Astin, obviously, Emma Kellen, those guys, I'll know. Yeah. Um, I, I Kate, was. Kate Blanchett as the Lady Galadriel. Mm, that was good casting. And Liv Tyler. I know that one too. Yep. But all of them across the board, even as I watch it now, it's just, it's perfect, right? The way that they make the skin look on the elves and the glowy and, and Liv Tyler's pale as it is. It just, all of it is so well, so well done. And that's, I think, the theme of what we're going to be talking about and what we could talk about for maybe hours is how well done and how much care was put into the Fellowship of the Ring. So one other cast member we haven't talked about is uh, Andy Circus? Yeah. So okay. Andy Circus, obviously, especially in Fellowship, like you only see him as Gollum, and so it's all the motion capture stuff. And I know this is like, like 2001, so like this is like early motion capture. Like motion cap has got you know mocap has gotten so much better um, in what they do. Like now, like if you remember when the Hobbit movies came out, um, Benedict Cumberbatch, like he did motion capture, but like just to get like a lot of his facial stuff like into the dragon smog and like now we can take a human face and like put like human kind of you know expressions and whatnot on a dragon but like back here this was like humanoid to humanoid 
but it doesn't look bad. Even though this movie's no. like 18 years old now, it does not look bad. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's, and that's what's the beauty of what Peter Jackson did with this film is creating kind of like what George Lucas did, these miniatures of these massive sets, these sprawling sets, and creating, making it feel or creating this illusion of realism and melding it with some of this early CG. Uh, it, it Sometimes the CG after that movie, a lot of the CG from those movies in the early 2000s, I get taken out of the experience now because the CG is just so bad. Spider-Man, the first Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. It's rough. Go, You're like, go back and uh, watch that, yep. Man, but I can still watch Lord of the Rings and I'm never taken out of the moment because it's so well done. All the special effects are just top notch it's true there is that i also think it's also because we set it in a fantasy world so like that's true too yeah when you watch spider-man he's swinging around new york and all of a sudden like it gets really blurry and you know fuzzy it's like okay that shouldn't look like that but in a fantasy world like it looks like what they tell you it should look like yeah and that's a little different i think too that i think that just helps maybe a little bit agree agree so i i just i was always I was enamored when the special editions came out and I was able to watch all of the behind the scenes on Mm -hmm. how they made all of those sets. And it's just, it's a A huge undertaking. Oh my gosh. You just realize, I mean, and that's a theatrical release of the movie that we saw. Right. And now you, we have all these extended editions and you're watching 12 hours of content, right? Three movies. And it's, and and now it's, I don't know if I could go back to the theatrical release because I'm like, hey, where's my favorite scene with whatever yeah. it is that happened? I don't even know what's theatrical and what's extended now. I only watch extended editions now. Right. Yep. yep. It's beautiful. Mm, that it is. That it is. All right. So casting, I think, is good. Well, what else? One of my what favorite else? parts of Ooh, yeah. the of just the series, but especially, again, we're talking about the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring, the music, Ooh, the, yes. the way that it makes you feel. I mean, now, right? It's almost got a nostalgic feel to me now when I hear, you know, the music from the Shire and I just go, <sighs> and I can, I see it, I can smell it. You know, it's, it's, the music is, again, another integral part of all successful movie franchises. It has to have iconic music and this certainly does not disappoint well the interesting thing too is that uh professor professor tolkien wrote like some poems and some like music and more like kind of like a uh almost like chants or something like he wrote a bunch of music into his books yeah so they took from his writings these songs or lyrics and they put tunes to them, which was really interesting because, uh, you know, the song, the road goes ever on and on yeah. down from the door where it began. It's, you know, this kind of theme that they play uh, in in Hobbiton, in the Shire. But like those lyrics come right from the book. It also... Uh, later was something that they kind of took it and put into the Hobbit movies. It kind of been in the old Hobbit cartoon. Um, some of the songs about the Misty Mountains and some of that's like it just. Yeah, I love that they wrote such beautiful Howard Shore, who did the score and was the composer, did such beautiful, beautiful work to really give this world this extra rich context layer of just like living like it's just like this living breathing thing it doesn't feel like a dead world we're just kind of watching the music is just amazing like you know we're in a we're in a magical land where dwarves and (laughs) elves and hobbits and humans all interact in the same world yep and like he sets this perfect perfect score to it that makes it think like yeah that totally could happen in a place like this Mm -hmm. and i love it i've got i've got those on digital and i listen to them all the time it's peaceful, most of it. Too. I mean, just, I, ugh, it's, it's amazing. So I think all, all great, all great films have a great score. And this one is, it's, it stands up still. Yep. As you mentioned, you still listen to it and you still go, ah, oh, man, it's so good. Uh-huh. And then you want to watch the movie. You're like, ooh, so good. It's so good. I think that 
the Fellowship of the Ring in particular is I, I like all the movies. All, yeah. all all three of the movies are really great. And certainly there are certain parts of other movies that I like more than parts of the Fellowship of the Ring. What, but one thing that I love so much about the Fellowship of the Ring is the pacing of the movie. There's not, I mean, you, you get introduced to these characters in a slowly one at a time or two at a time with Merry and Pippin and the story begins to unfold, but it doesn't take hours before you're on an adventure. Right. You're not always positive what the adventure is or at least for me, right? Because I'd never read the book, so I, I wasn't right. sure what adventure I was on. I just knew, holy crap, this ring is crazy, and there's really dark stuff after them. And then it just you get kicked in the high gear from yeah. the frolicking in the garden with Mary and Pippin of them stealing, you know, vegetables to tumbling down the mountain and hiding from Mushrooms. ring wraiths. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, this is. It's amazing. So the, just the way that they pace it to so the peaceful beginnings and then moments of sheer danger yep. and, and the way they introduce each character, how they introduce Strider. I mean, the the way that they unfold it was easy for somebody like me who had never been part of this franchise before. It was easy for me to digest and understand what was going on and to be completely captivated in this world and these characters that I didn't know anything about. But by the you know, with five minutes with each character, I knew exactly who they were and, and their motivation and whether they were good or bad for the most part and how that all interplays. I just I just think that the pacing of the film is fantastic. You you get a breather when you need a breather and then it's just moments of sheer tension when you need it. I, I don't know. So it's it's interesting because I read the books and I'd known the story. So like I like I said, I'd known the story for years and years and years before the movie ever came out. But what's interesting though is like all of these things like are in the book. And the book doesn't necessarily drag. It's not necessarily a slow book because it's not. But it does, you know, Professor Tolkien does do a, a great amount of world building and setting stuff up. And in a movie, like obviously there we visually can can do that. So what would take maybe a paragraph or two to describe a number of things can be established like in a three second shot. Yeah. Um, so I think that, uh, that, you know, um, Fran Walsh and Philippa Baboyans or Baboyans, Philippa Boyens, And then of course, Peter Jackson did a really great job of like writing a screenplay based off these books that helped take the very descriptive world that professor Tolkien lays out. Right. And really, like, cut to the heart of it. And, like, the way and, – and this – gosh, this, this isn't necessarily pacing uh, per se, but I'm kind of broaching this, I guess. But the way I always visualized this world to be, how it looks, how the Shire looks, like mm. how – you know, how the Black Gate, I mean, we don't get there in the Fellowship, but like how the Black Gate, how uh, Rivendell looks, um, all that stuff I've seen in my head. And Professor Tolkien writes so vividly that when I saw the film, and I'm sitting there, and this is, you know, 2001, I'm 21, I'm sitting in the movie theater and I'm watching Fellowship, it looks to me exactly how I've seen the That's Shire awesome. in my head. And I mean, that's just amazing. And like, and then, like you said, like the pacing, just how it moves along. And we tell that story that's true to the source material for the most part. It's just, oh, it's so good. So good. It's, I mean, that's a testament to obviously the source material, but also to those that worked on the film to be able to do exactly what you said. I'm sure they're hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who had read those books before they saw the movie and then went, this is exactly as I pictured it. And that's a true testament to, I don't know how incredible they were at creating what Professor Tolkien had, you know, put on paper. It just, well, I mean, I mean, this is a little thing, you know, because awards aren't everything, but the movie Fellowship of the Ring was nominated for 13 Oscars. Golly. 13. And it won four. Best Cinematography, Best Makeup, Best Original Score, and Best Visual Effects. Like, all of those, like, if you listen to, like, Cinematography, Makeup, Score, and Visual Effects are really the big things that, like, 
help set that world and like help make yeah. you feel like you're in a fantasy world. And all that was written by Professor Tolkien and it was adapted by, you know, Walsh, Boyens, and Jackson. And obviously, like, the Academy thought that, like, they did such an amazing stellar job that they got four Academy Awards, four Oscars for basically the things you need to do to create this A fantasy world. world. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's fun to go back and I don't know, experience it all the time. I'm definitely going to watch this movie tomorrow now. <laughs> Great. Oh, so A good. Long, you have long to. day ahead of me. Nice. Um, but, okay, so one of... I think one of one of my favorite characters in in the series and he's really only in the fellowship he is only in the fellowship is Boromir. Mm-hmm. And I find his character arc to just be I I always fall for these guys like Billy when I was talking about in Stranger Things, right? These guys who are just conflicted. And yeah. you you hope down in your heart of hearts that they're good. And you want them to be good. And I think with Boromir, one of the things that I love most about his character and, and how he's portrayed and the way that he's written is, I think we all can kind of relate to him. But for me, when I watch that, I, I, I like to, I don't like to think of myself as Boromir, but I, in reality, I am Boromir. And I think we all are like Boromir at times where we want to, we're idealistic in that we want to do what's right and we want to do it in, in a way that's efficient and effective. And we want to believe that we are not going to succumb to the pressures and the temptations and the power that one might be trying to to get. Um, but there are moments of weakness where we're going to succumb and we're going to fall and we're going to make mistakes. And it's I just love at the end of the – spoilers – I love at the end of the movie how he – kind of he redeems himself right he you know repents of his past transgressions and you know it's this redemptive arc in this one movie that made me feel so many different emotions and when i go back and watch it i can't i I can't help but feel for him and feel that i am like him Mm. in so many different ways that's one of my favorite you know character arcs in the whole entire series and it takes place only within me Bormir shows up what halfway through the movie yeah, and uh, and I feel like I don't know. I I relate to him. I, I feel a kinship with him. Hmm. So I'm trying to think like if I had to pick one character from Fellowship that I would say is like my favorite character. Ah, that's so hard. But I think I would choose Strider because we totally. we really call him Strider in this film because he really doesn't reveal his name. To be Aragorn. I mean, I guess he kind of does later in this film, but but you know, the hobbits call him Strider. And the reason is is because I love his story of, you know, he's you know, he says he's a ranger of the north. When like really he is not. He is, you know, w- you know, he would be the king of Gondor. Mm-hmm. But because of things and the way things have happened, you know, he's he's not in Gondor. Uh, Gondor doesn't have a king, even though he is the rightful king. And he's kind of like running from his true destiny, his true yeah. yeah. kind of calling, his true, you know, responsibility. Um, and we kind of find some of this out. And of course, in the extended editions, we find out a little bit more because he's got conversations with Arwen and you realize that he is the heir of, you know, Prince Isildur of Gondor who, you know, cut the, cut the ring from Sauron's finger. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like his line, like that's like the history of his line. And like, you f- realize like this is, you know, his quest maybe more than some others in a way. Uh, it's yeah. intricately tied to his family, a, a destiny that he does not want to give into. And I really love that kind of a storyline yeah. for me because like now when I see those storylines in books or movies or TV, like I kind of know where it's going to go. I know it's going to kind of usually take this path because Professor Tolkien wrote this, you know, now basically like 70 ish years ago almost. And, you know, it, it it's somewhat predictable now, but at the time, like it, it was, it was different and unique. Right. So 
that if I had to pick one, that would be the one. But that's a really hard choice because there's so many fun characters and good characters. It's it's very difficult to choose. Yep. You could pick any of them. I mean, Boromir is the one that I see myself as the coolest character. Got to be uh, Strider. He's so cool. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a cool guy. Mysterious, kind of yeah. cool, yeah. But like a bad A, and you're like, It's kind of like oh. that anti-hero type of, you know, yeah. stereotype. He's like, yeah. I mean, a Han Solo type in that, like, I don't know, like a like a Ruffigan kind of, and you're not yep. sure what he's going to do, and is he really good? But Maybe we could say that Han Solo is a Strider type or an Aragorn type. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, <laughs> really, I mean, yeah. I, I just, yeah, I yep. think there, there's, there's so many cool scenes. Can you think of, I don't know what your favorite scene might be from that movie? I know it's hard to pick since, or it's hard mm. to remember since it may have been a little while and it's hard to kind of separate all three movies, but yeah, there's so many things. Um, the opening shot of the Shire and Hobbiton for me is in my mind so iconic because it was that moment of like, here's this world that I've known for a long time that I've loved this story and loved this setting so much and seeing that and the music and everything like it. I just think about it now and there's, yeah, it is amazing, amazing, amazing. And I think for me, that's probably going to be my favorite kind of scene or like opening the shot of that movie yeah even though there's a ton like mm, there's so many i could list but <laughs> so i think that guys. i think that one because of just what it meant to me to see this thing that i loved finally on the big screen what about you i think uh, like you i mean it's near impossible for me and i'm sure that in five minutes it would be a different answer i think i'll just go with my favorite ish part is the whole the whole chase scene and getting into the prancing pony and that whole I don't know that whole epic struggle and I don't know that 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 portion of the movie is probably my favorite part that tense introduction to what a ring wraith is the introduction to strider and then the Nazgul getting faked out and duped mm-hmm. all of that part was it, it's so tense and you can feel the tension with all the characters including Strider who you, I mean there's just stuff's going down uh, I like all the way that shot I just think all, all of that part is probably my favorite I know that's a long scene <laughs> but that is like my favorite part I think yeah then the mm. shots of the orc army being born and all that stuff is really cool. and That's gross and awesome. So do you want to hear some uh, interesting tidbits? Uh, maybe you know these, maybe you don't. I thought since the movie's been out a while, this isn't really spoilery, but uh, talking about the cast. So um, we know that Elijah Wood was the first person that was cast for any of the roles um, the website, the one ring kind of, you know, uh, broke, uh, news of that. But one of the, like, there was like something like 150 actors that auditioned, but someone else that auditioned for the role was Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh my who recently gosh. just played Mysterio in Spider-Man Far From Home. Um, Ian McKellen, <laughs> who plays Gandalf first, Sean Connery was approached for the role. Oh, boy. But he didn't understand the plot, so that didn't go forward. (laughs) Um, That seems right. Patrick Stewart. Okay, yeah. Turned it down because he disliked the script. (laughs) Um, So before being cast, Ian McKellen uh, had to kind of work out some stuff with 20th Century Fox because there was like a two-month overlap with him playing Magneto in the X-Men movie. And so basically, like, those movies kind of came out at the same time. Um, and he basically said that he, he enjoyed playing Gandalf more than, than he did playing, you know, uh, Magneto. Yeah. He said it was just, you know, a little more interesting. Um, Sean Astin like was, uh, just became a father before he, oh, before yeah. he played the role. So, cause he's actually a little bit older, right? Cause he was a child yes. actor when he was in the Goonies. Yeah. It's been a while. 
so he was considerably older, even though he had to play kind of like, you know, a early thirties ish something character. Um, but Vigo Mortensen, uh, actually was not the first person, uh, offered the role. Daniel day Lewis wow. was offered the part, um, during like pre-production, but he turned it down. Nicholas Cage received an offer, oh, th- but he turned that down due to, I think like family obligations. Vin Diesel, um, Vin Diesel, uh, wanted, was, was considered Stuart Townsend was actually cast in the role. And then he was replaced by Phil, by uh, Peter Jackson. Cause he basically said he was too young. Russell Crowe wow. was considered as a replacement, but he turned it down cause he was doing uh gladiator time. Kind of felt like it was too similar. Okay. Then Daniel day Lewis was offered the role a second time, wow. but declined again. I remember, I remember hearing that Daniel day Lewis had turned it down both times. And then finally the executive producer, Mark Ordesky saw Viggo Mortensen in a play and Mortensen's son was a fan of the book and convinced his dad to take the role. Um, he basically read the book um, on like a on a plane and then decided like, yeah, that's what he was going to do. And he started wow. carrying his sword around off screen to try to get ready. Like, you know, he didn't know uh, quite a quite a ton. Uh, Gimli was originally going to be Billy Connolly. I don't know if you know the, the comedian mm-hmm. Billy Connolly. He later was cast as... Um, Dane Ironfoot in the Hobbit trilogy. Oh, okay. He yeah. kind of had like the red beard and like the big, uh, yes. the big, ha- uh, yeah. uh, I'll say it hammer. Uh, you know, um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else. Oh, oh yeah. Bruce Willis was, uh, a big fan and expressed interest in being Boromir. And Liam Neeson was also sent the script to be Boromir, but he passed on it. Oh, wow. Could you imagine Liam Neeson as Boromir? I, it's it it blows my mind. Uh, you remember Radagast the Brown? Yes, in, in the movie Sylvester yes. McCoy, he he actually was asked to be Bil- the older Bilbo Baggins, but he turned it down. Oh, so really? A- anyway, there's just like you know, Lucy Lawless was talked about being Lady Galadriel, but she did she turned it down because she was pregnant at the time. Oh my god! And like I can't remember anyone other than like. I couldn't imagine anyone other than Kate Blanchett now no. um, doing it. But here's the here's the cool thing. Um, Christopher Lee, who plays Saruman, was a major fan of the book, had actually met Professor Tolkien before Professor Tolkien had died. Wow. Uh, he originally uh, wanted to play Gandalf, but they said he was basically too old. Yeah. So they gave him the role as uh, Saruman. Um <laughs> David Bowie expressed interest in yeah. playing Lord Elrond, but they basically said he's too famous, so yeah, Peter Jackson no, wasn't gonna no. wasn't gonna cast him. So anyway, I, some interesting kind of casting. Like I'm always curious about this because this cast I feel is so iconic. These movies became so big, mm. but to think like what it could have been if like Nicolas Cage played Aragorn and Jake Gyllenhaal was Frodo, and what if Patrick Stewart or Sean Connery had played. Gandalf or you know what if what if it would have been you know gosh like Lucy Lawless as Galadri- Galadriel good would the movie would the movie has been as good with that kind of a cast I don't know find out oh, in what if by Marvel on Disney Plus <laughs> right <laughs> I don't know uh, that, that those are some those are some big names getting thrown out there I mean, you got to think it was a big, huge ensemble cast. So, like, a lot of Hollywood is probably up for, for this. A lot you of know, different this roles. movie. Yeah. And remember that this was like the first big movie that filmed like pretty much all three movies like at the same time, and then right. broke them up into separate movies. Yep. Yep. I love how they did all that. It made it more cohesive. Yep. But anyway, Fellowship's a great movie. One of my yep. favorites. So many things we could talk about for hours and hours and hours and every little detail of every scene. And I just, uh, it's got a special place in my heart. So I got to say, having read the books, um, and I'm not going to get into all this, but like there was some, some differences with like the original, like the book, the fellowship of the ring versus the movie. Mm -hmm. But I got to say like, out of all the like changes, most of them all felt pretty, small to me like 
they're like, for instance, like, you know, when Mary and Pippin and like everyone's in um, Moria, right? Yes. And there's this whole thing where you see uh, they're, you know, they're kind of in the the tomb and it's, um, oh gosh, what is it? Is it Mary? Uh, no, it's Pippin. Sorry. Pippin like knocks over that, uh, the whole yes. skeleton the- and he goes in. Yep. Right. And then, of course, you know, then brings all the orcs. But like in the book, he picks up a pebble. It's like a little pebble and he throws it down and then it makes a bunch of noise, you know, kind of, uh, you know, bouncing off the walls and going down. So like that, like things like that, like it's a small change, like a skeleton or a pebble. It's something that fell down the well that alerted all the orcs that something's going on in Moria and, you know, brings the Balrog, right? Um, There's like little changes like that that I think was fine. Um, but two big things that a lot of fans brought up is one, a character was cut out from the film, was not in the film that's in the books, and that's Tom Bombadil. Um, Tom Bombadil is kind of this, oh gosh, I don't even know how to describe him, kind of like this, mm, almost like almost like a very powerful character that like the ring wouldn't have like any say on him, like Tom Bombadil could put the ring on his finger and yep. like it wouldn't it wouldn't affect him. Right. Basically. Um so in, in the book, like he talks to him, he gives the, you know, the hobbits some advice and it's it's a nice chapter or two, but like honestly, while I missed that from the book, it wouldn't have served any real purpose to the story of the movie. So like I understand why he's cut, but a lot of people wanted that. The other big thing that was kind of different, which I think is why you like Boromir a lot, because you get this uh, arc that resolves around his character, is that in the book, the book was written to be one volume, but his the publishers, you know, split it up, right, into three volumes. Um, but the way it was written, that when you have the death of Boromir, and there's like this huge battle, right? Yeah. Um, and... It sets up, you know, the the splitting of of the fellowship and whatnot, and the breaking of it in a in a way, right? That that doesn't really happen in the book. The way it's written in the book is that basically, you know, uh, Frodo goes up, Boromir goes up there, you know, to talk to him and try to convince him to take it back to Gondor. He's kind of gripped with the madness, and then you know, Frodo puts on the ring. He kind of slips away. And then we kind of follow kind of Frodo and Sam trying to get across the river. And then when we flip back to it in the book, basically you hear, you know, the horn. And then you find that Aragorn has found Boromir and he's been, you know, hit and fletched with a whole bunch of arrows. And he tells Aragorn kind of like what happened, tells him that, they ah. took the ho- they, that he that they right. took the hobbits and whatnot. Whereas in the movie, it's like this big battle sequence that we get, which is kind of where we finish the movie. So it's kind of completely kind of a different way to do it, but it's really 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 good in the sense that like visually it makes a lot more sense to make it kind of like this kind of big epic kind of feeling battle to end and cap the movie yes. versus like in the book it just kind of feels like it just kind of stops and now you're ready to go to the next one right. And, and continue reading, and so you know it. It they they end a little bit different places, but essentially it's kind of right around that same moment. So yeah, interesting. So a few things, but like there's other like little small things, but I feel like those are the only two big things. I felt that was very close to the source material. Right, right, right. So uh, funny story though. I took my sister Andra to go see the movie when it first came out. I'd already seen like two or three times. Mm-hmm. She'd never seen it. She'd never read the books. So I took her to the movie and she the whole time was just like, oh, wow, wow, like hmm. totally into it. And then at one point I see her like look down and like check her clock and, and, you know, like on her watch and she's like, okay. And then the movie ends and she just literally stands up and says, what? You got to be kidding me. Because she was thinking that the movie was going to end and we were going to like resolve the entire story. Oh my gosh. And I was like, and she's like, what? What, what what happened? I was like, oh, well, this is the end of this movie. There's going to be more. And she's like, what? How many? And I was like, 
two more. It's going to be three movies. She's like, well, when does the next one come out? I was like, oh, the second one comes out next year. And then that one comes out the year after. And she just looked at me. She's like, you got to be kidding me. I want to know what happens. It's awesome. And so I told her, I was like, uh, go read the books then. Because yeah. otherwise you're going to wait two years to find out the full conclusion. Right. So I don't know if you knew because you said you hadn't read the books. Did you know that this was going to be multiple movies yes. or did that surprise you? No, I, I knew that it was going to be multiple movies and I was very excited about that. And I was glad that, I mean, this is, this is not a thing we do now. It's released every year. Yep. Boom, boom, boom. Now it's like, boom, wait a few years, boom, wait a few years. And this one, they just, yep. they just went for it. Yeah. They, they had it on tap, ready to go. So, Matt, your opinion, like this movie, like wh- where do you, like what kind of rating do you give this movie? That's, I, I mean, I think I kind of led with that at the beginning. It's a top tenner for me uh, as far as just all time, all genres included. It, it, and it's, okay, it's a top ten all time and it's a number one in what I would call um, epics. If that okay. makes sense, you know, including, you know, the Harry Potters and anything that's basically three or more movies. It might be my favorite of like the epics, mm. if that makes sense. When you throw Star Wars in there, then I start to go, well, maybe it's not. But right. I think in the fantasy epics, I'll say not like sci fi fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It, it's what I'm trying to say is high praise from me it's the casting the way it makes me feel the way i i feel about the characters and i i just i don't know i really 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 like it the villains are scary the orcs were terrifying yep that white face orc oh my gosh and he's pulling the sword and he's like Wah! at the end oh my gosh so good and then the head kid gets cut off anyway all of yep. it is just it really is a superb film. I don't know. I mean, I don't know that they could have done it any better. I don't believe it could have been done. Any better. I don't think so. They, yeah. they, they caught lightning in a bottle and it's, and it will stand the test of time for ever. Never remake these movies. Oh, please. Never. Uh, if I'm looking at this objectively, if I'm talking just fantasy movies and I like a lot of fantasy movies, Fellowship of the Ring is my favorite fantasy movie of all time. Yeah. If I'm going all movies, this I think Fellowship probably cracks the top five mm. of my favorite movies Love of all time. And I'd have I'd have to sit down and I'd have I, man maybe we should do that sometime oh. like our, our top five <laughs> movies of all time. But I'm I'm easily gonna say that this Fellowship of the Ring ranks in my top five movies of all time. Ugh. So, I mean, it is just that good. I mean, it is adap- adaptation from the source m- material, the music, the casting, the cinematography, the mm. pacing. Like, I don't feel that there's many missteps in this film. I, I really don't. And and that's not just me being like a super fanboy, although I am. Uh, I, I really, truly do feel that this is a movie that if there are mistakes, if there are stumbles or slower spots like they're very very small and they don't like they're not glaring there's no like a big glaring weaknesses i agree i think especially with the theatrical versions i think there's some parts of the extended when it goes with aragorn talking with Liv tyler's characters some of those moments can be a little bit draggy for me at times i'm trying to remember i think that's in fellowship when there's a, there's just mm-hmm. a lot of exposition on their relationship, yep. and then it kind of yeah, gets a little the, bit when they're like, in Rivendell. Yeah, yeah, you're like okay, this is a little bit, mm-mm-mm, but that's the only moment that I can pick out really in the whole trilogy where I'm like, okay, yeah, speed it up. I get it. I gosh, I can't wait. So like we've been reading the Hobbit novel, the Hobbit book, with the boys, but it, we've kind of slowed down, and it's been you know a couple months <laughs> since we've done that. Right. I, I can't wait for my boys to get old enough that I can share this experience with them. Yeah. But admittedly it is PG 13 and we do see some beheadings of orcs in this film. There are some scarier elements. I know that I cannot, I cannot in good faith show them this until they're considerably older. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I will ruin them. I will ruin the movie for them 
and it'll break my heart. Nobody it'll wants just break that. my heart. All right, Matt. So my question of the week is a little a little off this, but it's inspired by this. So obviously, my love of this movie uh, and the adaptation from the source material. Uh, is super strong. So my question for you and then for the super fans, and I'll answer it as well, but I think you're going to know what my answer is going to be. What what do you think is the best adaptation of a book to a movie? That's my question for you and the super friends this week. Okay. So what do you think? What is the best adaptation of a book to a movie? This is hard because there's been a lot of really great adaptations, especially in the last decade or two. Um, oh gosh, the, <laughs> my heart says Harry Potter. Okay. My, Are we talking like, do you, do you have a specific movie I only, to well, book? Well, I, I would just say you, the first one, just because it's, okay. it's what set what the rest of the movies are going to be. I also think it's the closest adaptation of um, the book to the movie. Ex- exactly. Yeah. It, 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 because the rest of the books, they get longer and there's just way too much going on in the books for it to be properly translated to the screen. Sure. Um, the first one though is, is a short book and makes for easy adaptation. And yeah, it's a, it's mostly how I remember it. Um, so I, and I don't say that just because I loved Harry Potter. That was growing up. I mean, we've already talked about this in, yeah. in, in the past, like that was important to me as growing up and to see it on the screen was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, my heart says Harry Potter, but after this discussion, <laughs> how can it not be the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring? Mm-hmm. So th- those are, I mean, and who knows? The Super Friends are at an advantage. They get a week to think about it, or a couple of days at least to think about it. it Matt, it's okay if you want to go with your heart. It's okay. My, my like heart there's, says there's Harry no, Potter. There's no, there's no wrong answers with this question. I love Harry Potter. Okay. So you're gonna lock in Harry Potter, Sorcerer's Stone. I'll say Harry Potter, yeah. I, I think so. I think that's a great, great pick because I do feel like that is an extremely close adaptation of the source material to the movie. It really is. Yep. Uh, I cannot fault you for that at all. Mine is this. It is Fellowship of the Ring. It is my favorite uh, adaptation. I think it's a very, very close adaptation. It probably for the same reason like for you with Harry Potter like it is the world that you'd envisioned in your head brought to life yeah. in such a fantastic fantastical way uh, so it's this but super friends I want to hear from you this week what do you think is the best adaptation of like a book or some sort of source material to a film so that could even be like a video game to a movie or a comic book like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to a movie, whatever you let us know all the usual places, email, Facebook, Twitter, the Instagram, the voicemail, let us know. And we will talk about that next week, Matt. I was glad you picked this. I'm glad you picked something that I knew intimately. I could talk about really (laughs) easily because I was, uh, I gotta be honest. I I was a little worried with my shortness of ability to prep for this week. So thank you for tossing me a bone and doing me quite the solid favor. Anytime. Well, from all of us here at the Fortress of Nerditude, to all of you out there, wherever you may be, may the Force be with you. Always. Ha, 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 ha.